In a remote area of the Siberian tundra, dotted with low trees and shrubs, there's a place that locals and the media call the Gateway to Hell. In the summer, the sound of water flowing down the rocky slopes is occasionally interrupted by the roar of falling chunks of earth. The ominous sounds heighten the anxiety of the indigenous peoples of Yakusha who live near the gates. Their fear is well-founded. But not because something terrible might emerge from the massive crater. The reason lies elsewhere. I guarantee today's episode will be super interesting, so I'll go make some coffee in the meantime. <sighs> the coffee wasn't great. The beans were over-roasted. As usual, an unobtrusive reminder to those who like my content, please remember to like the video, either while watching or at the end. I also appreciate everyone who respects my wish to stay anonymous. What if I told you that there are mysterious holes appearing in Siberia all the time, constantly surprising scientists? For example, in August 2020, a Russian television crew flying over the Siberian tundra spotted a massive crater 98 feet deep and 66 feet wide. Those Russian TV folks sure have a great eye for measurements. Good for them. But the crater was impressive not only for its size, but also for its symmetry, as well as the power that must have been required to create it. And there isn't just one or two craters, their number is actually tough to gauge. You might wonder, can you really miss a gigantic hole in the ground? Yes, it's easy. Because craters typically show up in uninhabited and mostly pristine areas of the Arctic. Often, there's no one to see them and share the news. If craters are found, it's mostly by accident during regular non-scientific helicopter flights. Or not from the air, but by reindeer herders and hunters. So after analyzing all the craters they managed to find, scientists figured out that they have some common features, particularly a hill rising from 6 to 20 feet that formed before they appeared. The craters were also located on gentle slopes and had a cylindrical bottom, like a can, which then opened up into a funnel with an opening diameter of about 65 to 80 feet. But the most important thing is that the craters exploded. I mean, they literally emerged as a result of an explosion, and all these blasts shot out ground ice, which in some cases left holes in the ground. Huge, frozen chunks melted, but the marks they left behind remained. Get the idea? At some point, the ground just swells up, the hill keeps getting bigger, reaches those 6 to 20 feet, and then bursts like a giant soil pimple. Experts believe that the super hot summers in the area in 2012, 2016, and 2020 could have contributed to the growth of these hills. It's believed that the entire process from the emergence of a mound to the explosion takes only about three to five years. However, one expert's not convinced that the main reason for these craters is the warming associated with climate change. The villages and livestock communities he spoke to told him that older generations shared stories of explosions creating craters in the tundra, meaning that this has been happening long before the current global warming. But we'll get back to the secret of crater formation later. Anyway, over the years, researchers have identified 15 more suspected craters from these natural explosions. The newly discovered hole number 17 might turn out to be the biggest of the ones we already know about. Actually, the first question that came to my mind was whether craters pose any threat to people. Well, in general, not many have witnessed these explosions because, as you remember, there's almost nobody around. The key word here is almost, because there are people even in these remote areas. In 2017, a local reindeer herder witnessed the explosion of a hill on the Yamo Peninsula. Every morning, she climbed up that hill because it was the highest point in the area, making it easier to watch over the reindeer. On the day of the explosion, she also went up the hill but felt a strange movement, so she got scared and ran away. When she was about 650 or 1,000 feet away, the explosion went off. The woman could have died. There's also expensive oil and gas infrastructure here that could be damaged by explosions. Other craters have formed less than two miles from the railroads and oil pipelines. It's clear what's around the craters, but inside? In fact, only a few scientists managed to go down into the crater to investigate how it formed and why it exploded in the first place. But one team actually succeeded. Evgeny Chuvalin, a leading research fellow at the Skolkovo Institute of Science and Technology Center for Hydrocarbon Recovery, gathered a team and together they descended into one of the craters in 2017. Accessing the craters required climbing gear and the opportunities were limited. The craters turned into lakes within two years of forming. 
Scientists gathered samples of permafrost, soil, and ice from the edge of a hole called the Urkuta Crater. This crater, by the way, was discovered by biologists who were watching falcon nesting in the area. Six months later, researchers conducted observations again, but this time using a drone. The main issue with these craters is how incredibly fast, in geological terms, they form. Plus, the life of a crater is short, too. Like I said, in a couple of years, they become lakes. Here's what the crater looks like today. Despite the research, scientists aren't exactly sure how this huge hole formed. This one and others like it, too. Initial theories that came up after the first crater was found near the oil and gas field on the Yamal Peninsula included a meteorite impact, the collapse of a secret underground military storage facility, and even a UFO landing. Apparently not a very successful one. Even at this time, there's no universally accepted theory about how these holes form. However, there are several theories that are more believable than the initial ones. The first one is gas. Scientists believe that the giant holes are caused by explosive accumulations of methane, a potent greenhouse gas. While in one part of Siberia, methane leads to the formation of these burning lakes, in another, the permafrost covering two-thirds of Russia is a huge natural reservoir of methane. And recently, as I mentioned before, the region has experienced unseasonably hot periods. Keep this thought in mind. So gases in general, and methane in particular, can accumulate in the upper layers of permafrost from several sources, both from deep layers of the Earth and closer to the surface. Gas collects in an area known as cryopeg, a layer that never freezes due to the salt content beneath the layer of ground ice acting as a trap. The release of methane from permafrost may be caused by the increase in air and ground temperatures over the last few decades. In our case, it's been especially noticeable in the last few years. Then, gas bursts out, deforming the ice in the ground, forming a mound. And then, one very warm summer, an explosion happens that breaks through the upper layers of permafrost, scattering dirt, ice, and rocks. In short, a pretty standard version of how craters appear. Standard, but not the only one. Remember during the field trip in 2017, the scientists took samples. Samples of all sorts from the Yakuta crater. Then, they analyzed them and built their model of how the crater formed. This model suggests that it formed in a dried-up lake, which probably had what's called an underlake talic, a zone of unfrozen soil that gradually began to freeze after the lake dried up, creating tension that ultimately released in a powerful explosion. It ended up being something like an ice volcano. And <laughs> that sounds cool. Cryovolcanism, as some researchers call it, is a very poorly studied and described process in the cryosphere, an explosion involving rocks, ice, water, and gases leaving behind a crater. If you Google this concept, you'll probably come across descriptions of this phenomenon on other planets, and only then will you find something about ours. It's that unusual. And in fact, it fits perfectly into the overall picture, because you won't find craters like these anywhere else in the world. They only form here. Scientists are actually claiming that the craters are probably unique to this area of the Arctic, and even point out the reason. There are special conditions here. It's a combination of flat underground ice at the surface, continuous permafrost saturated with methane, and unfrozen soil with salt deposits beneath the ice. Susan Natali, the Arctic Program Director at the Woodwell Climate Research Center, is using satellite data to try to identify and map craters that haven't been noticed by humans. So Susan claims that not a single crater has been discovered or recorded in the Arctic in Alaska or Canada. All the found craters are located in the same region of Siberia, on the Yamal and Gaida peninsulas. And all the craters look pretty much the same, not changing over time, except for filling with water. However, there's one crater that's constantly growing, and no one can stop it. Yes, we've made it to the crater you saw in the preview. And it's real. But guess what? The Batagay Crater, sometimes referred to as Batagayka, is actually not a crater at all. And alas, it's not the gateway to hell either. This is what scientists refer to as a retrogressive thaw slump, or an expanding hole caused by melting permafrost and rapid land subsidence. Didn't get that? That's okay, I felt the same way at first. In simple terms, what you're looking at is just a really, really slow landslide. Super slow. It's in no hurry at all. This is the largest slump of its kind in the world, and it's continually expanding. Currently, the Batagay Crater covers over 214 acres, earning it the title of a mega slump. It's located in the Chersky Range area in the Verkoyansk region of Yakutia. 
It was named after the nearby river of the same name, and its depth reaches 328 feet, which is pretty impressive. Especially when it comes to the sizes, because Batagay is so huge that it's visible even from space. And yeah, it resembles the print of a giant tadpole. This is what it looks like compared to the meteor crater in Arizona, which is about 0.8 miles wide and roughly 590 feet deep. The size of the asteroid that created the meteor crater was probably between 100 and 165 feet. But Batagay didn't need any meteorites. It came into being all on its own. Well, almost. It all started as a barely noticeable strip in declassified satellite images from the 1960s. And then, in just 30 years, the hole tripled in size. For geology, that's like a snap of the fingers. What else do scientists know? According to them, Batagay started forming in the mid-1900s and was first spotted in satellite images in the 1960s. It wasn't noticed before because, well, there weren't any satellites. But since Batagay was noticed, it expands every year in a characteristic horseshoe shape, growing especially fast at the top of the slope where the silt and soil slide off most easily. And just so you understand, the processes are really fast. Between 1991 and 2018, the wall of the crater retreated by an average of 36 feet per year, sometimes speeding up to as much as 98 feet. Overall, Batagay has lost a total of 1.22 million cubic feet of material over time, including underground ice and thawed soil. And it's not planning to stop. The slump just keeps growing, showing no signs of stabilizing for the past 40 years. But it must have started somewhere. And scientists have a theory. The mega slump, now resembling a giant tadpole, was likely caused by deforestation and the passage of off-road track vehicles moving over the fragile tundra during exploration and mining. Nobody had stomped around here with that much force before, and the ground was calm. However, vehicles and deforestation have destroyed the vegetation that acts like a cozy blanket, keeping the permafrost intact. With the loss of this cover, erosion has washed away the topsoil, exposing the permafrost to the sun, wind, and precipitation. In fact, most of the permafrost on the planet dates back from thousands to tens of thousands of years before past ice ages. According to the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, about 15% of the northern hemisphere is covered by permafrost. But in general, permafrost refers to any ground that remains completely frozen for at least two years. Basically, if you stick a pot of soil in the freezer, you can also create your little permafrost. But that's not what I'm talking about right now. If you open the permafrost, like it happened in our case, it'll start to melt and the ground will gradually soften, turning into mud. What had been solid for a long time will collapse in on itself, flowing down into local streams and rivers along with the melted ice. Sounds cool, and potentially dangerous. Though Batagay is in a remote place, a few miles away from the nearest human settlement, and it's unlikely it'll reach that settlement during its expansion. Although the locals are still scared, they stay away from the cliffs that mark the edges of the Batagay crater, worried that the hole could suddenly expand and take them in. And even though it's unlikely to happen all of a sudden, I can't blame them. But the expansion of Batagay itself is a sign of danger, so to speak, a warning signal. With rising temperatures and human pressure in the future, it's likely that more of these mega craters will form, and these new craters could very well end up too close to people, near human infrastructure threatening cities and transport. This, by the way, is not a unique case. In Whitehorse, Yukon's capital in Canada, one active crater is within sight of the Klondike Highway. It's so close that something needs to be done about it. And so last year, the Yukon government, where the slump is located, announced that work will soon begin to relocate a section of the Alaska Highway to the northwest. The expanding, subsiding layer of permafrost has already spread to the road's right of way a little longer, and it would lead to casualties. Just so you understand, when the researchers first noticed this slump, it was about 165 feet wide and located roughly 280 feet from the road. Now it's twice as wide and sits about 82 feet from the road and there's another smaller slump formed nearby. The new slump has been dubbed the baby slump, although specialists say it would be more accurate to call it teenage. It's growing too fast. However, no matter how terrifying the reasons and consequences of these slumps are, scientists are just thrilled, of course. The ground opens up so quickly that sometimes you can see decaying remains of long dead mammoths, musk oxen, and horses. Ancient tree stumps stick out of the ground. Batagay is particularly good at this, Researchers claim it provides a unique perspective on hundreds of thousands of years of the Earth's history because it exposes the oldest permafrost on the planet. 
seriously ancient. It's around 650,000 years old. This Siberian mega slump has provided a chance to peek into the climate of long gone eras and study everything that's been well preserved. For scientists, it's pretty much Christmas, but all year round. And considering that Batagay is constantly expanding, it keeps gifting the scientific community with more and more surprises. And each time, it's just great. For example, in 2018, scientists discovered the remains of an extinct foal with well-preserved skin, fur, tail, and hooves that died 42,000 years ago. This find provided the oldest sample of liquid blood ever discovered. This is actually the second case where a thawed Ice Age animal was found to have liquid blood. Before that, there was a mammoth that was 10,000 years younger than the foal. After thoroughly examining the find, scientists discovered that the foal belonged to the extinct Lena horses. These horses from the late Pleistocene and Holocene once inhabited Siberia, eastern Mongolia, northeastern China, and the Korean Peninsula. The Lena horses separated from the common ancestor of all modern horses about 115,000 years ago, and the youngest remains of this species date back to around 3000 BC. In short, it can be assumed that these horses went extinct around the time Egypt was reaching its peak and the pyramids were being built. As for the found foal, it was no more than two weeks old when the poor thing drowned in the mud. Notably, the icy permafrost preserved the skin and fur of the foal down to the smallest details. There was even urine left in the bladder. I agree, it doesn't sound great if you're eating, but paleontologists were really excited. And they keep getting excited, waiting for new finds, because Batagay remains active. As modern science knows, slumps caused by thawing can continue to expand for decades and only stop when they reach geological limits, that is, some point that can no longer collapse, usually the top of a slope or a body of water. The bottom of Batagay, a series of streams and shifting silt dunes, has nearly reached bedrock in many places, so it won't really sink any deeper. But the upper wall is expected to keep pushing forward. Batagay still has a long way to go. If you take a good look at the map, it becomes clear that Batagay could expand to cover the entire surrounding valley. Geologists say it might be completely swallowed up within the next decade or two. There used to be a valley, now there's no valley. Now it's the gateway to hell. And it can't be stopped for now, or at least we don't know how to do it yet. The thing is, the planet's getting hotter and hotter, more permafrost is melting, and more greenhouse gases are being released into the atmosphere. Greenhouse gases in the atmosphere cause even more warming, even more melting, and so on, forever. Once such a process kicks off, it gets really tough to do anything with it. It's not just difficult, it's downright unclear what to do. If the root cause lies in climate change, addressing the issue of global warming is essential to halt the expansion of Batagay. We can't handle this even without any mega slumps. Besides, the main mechanisms behind its growth, such as uncontrolled thermokarst formation superimposed on a downward-facing slope, aren't going to just vanish. I mean, they're not going anywhere. You can't control this because it's all about the laws of physics and chemistry. To be honest, I couldn't find any info on whether you can just go ahead and fill in the slump with dirt, probably because it makes no sense whatsoever. First of all, it would take a hell of a lot of soil, tons of machinery, and all this would need to be transported to a remote area that's already been damaged by a bunch of heavy equipment. On top of that, Batagay is a place where researchers and scientists are actively working. And besides, it's just pointless. The permafrost is melting, the slump is widening, no amount of soil on top will fix that. You've got to deal with the cause, not the effect, especially since there are more and more of these effects all over the world. Yes, the size of Batagay stands out, but you can find similar super slow slumps across the Arctic, particularly in some parts of northern Russia, Canada, and Alaska. Sadly, there's no official global statistics, but it's known that over the last 30 years, slumps have spread. Antony Lekowitz, a professor emeritus in the geography department at the University of Ottawa, says that when he began his career in 1983, there were about 60 active slumps on Banks Island, which, by the way, is about the size of Ireland. Now there are 4,000 of them. And I don't believe there's anything more to add here. Diseases from the Crater You probably know this already, but I'll say it again just in case. As the permafrost melts, ancient disease-causing pathogens might get released into the environment. 
They could not only survive in today's microbial landscape, but also take over, wiping out the diversity of microorganisms we're used to. It's hard to predict what would happen if something super dangerous and ancient thaws out, but it definitely worries scientists. So far, recent studies mostly rely on complex computer models to examine the behavior of old pathogens. However, there's a silver lining. You don't have to deal with real microbes, which greatly lowers the risk. If I were in the researcher's shoes, I definitely wouldn't want to work on them more than necessary, especially since ancient microorganisms, if accidentally released from the lab, could trigger a new pandemic by infecting people. Who needs another pandemic? By the way, a good example of how global warming is releasing diseases is the anthrax outbreak in Russia in 2016. In the Yamal-Nenets Autonomous District, there was an abnormal temperature rise up to 95 degrees Fahrenheit, which led to the thawing of permafrost. Yeah, that's what we're talking about. But here's the thing. After the ice melted, the remains of an infected reindeer were exposed, which caused the spread of the infection. I'm not hinting at anything, of course. But if you're not a scientist and live near Batagay, you really shouldn't go poking around in that crater. Hooves retain cold. According to 2020 research, in some regions of Siberia where horses were reintroduced, the soil retains carbon. Why would you care? Well, it retains carbon, so what? The thing is, it slows down ice melting, which means it slows global warming overall. The research is still in its early stages and needs confirmation, but the modeling results based on the collected data made me really happy. Here's what I mean. Siberian winters are notoriously cold. Despite this, the snow cover serves as excellent insulation, keeping the temperature of the topsoil at about 14 degrees Fahrenheit. When summer arrives, the temperature quickly rises above freezing, and the heat penetrates deep into the ground, activating the carbon layer within it. However, hoofed animals like horses and reindeer trample down the snow, reducing its insulating properties. And if the animals find greenery under the snow, they can clear the snow entirely, allowing the cold to reach so deep that even the warm summer can't fully melt it. So maybe we should bring in some horses and deer to our crater and it'll stop expanding. In theory, this could help but I doubt anyone will actually do that. Plus, there's a risk for the animals themselves. The crater is pretty big, and the hoofed animals could just fall in while they're stomping it down. And leave me a like since you've made it this far. See you later.